In um, previous lectures, we've looked at the Langevin equation for the motion of a particle in a fluid um, with an inertia term. In this video, we're going to look at the Langevin equation without inertia. Um, and this particular version of it is very, very useful in dealing with um, computer simulations. Okay, so in the previous videos, we've looked at analytic solutions and derived some some things from Langevin equation with inertia, but the other Langevin equation really comes into its its own when we deal with computer simulations of these kind of systems, and that's when it's used much more often. So, um, a reference for this. Uh, there is a book called The Theory of Positive Dynamics uh, by Massard Doy and Sir Sam Edwards, um, and there is a very brief section on this, section 3.3, .3, in fact, almost just a footnote in that section, which deals with uh, the Langevin equation without inertia. Uh, and um, in that section, uh, you can find out more about this kind of topic. Um, it's not a big part of the book, but it's a, it's a very good reference. All right, so why do we ignore inertia? Inertia here. So let's write down the Langevin equation um, for a sphere. Okay, so we've got the inertial term on the left, ma. We've got the drag term here for a sphere, 6 pi eta, Radius of sphere times the velocity. We've got the random noise term, maybe. Uh, well, we should have that all the time. And then we might have some other deterministic parts here as well. Okay. So, um, let's ignore the, um, the random noise term for the moment. So, we're going to get rid of that. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our particle and we're going to subject it to some sort of force. So, we put up another force here, if you like, here. And that force causes it to oscillate backwards and forwards like this uh, with a frequency which is f, and so its velocity looks like this. We're assuming we're imposing, we're choosing a force that imposes a velocity. This is the complex velocity here, you can just take the real part, um, which has a frequency f. So v equals v naught x 2 pi i f t. Okay? And that's equivalent to looking at the particle, looking at its motion on time scales of 1 on f, because if we have um, say the uh, velocity uh, versus time and it looks like this like this okay um, uh, where the frequency th this this time scale here is roughly uh, 2 pi on f let's say it's 1 on f roughly ignoring numerical prefactors um, if we're looking at say a long time many many cycles of this basically um, all this averages out to zero, all these oscillations average out to zero, and you don't get anything. So on time scales much longer than 1 on f, um, you're basically not looking at anything. Uh, and if you're looking at time scales much smaller than 1 on f, then, of course, the particle's only going from there to there, and you're not looking at much either. So if you're oscillating at, 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 at frequency f, you're looking at time scales which are roughly that sort of time scale. Right? That's, how, that's how you're looking at the particle. Now, um, let's look at these terms here. So we've got on the left here an inertial term. So this is just this should be inertial, not internal, inertial. Um, the inertial term is m to v dt, which you can write as 2 pi m f v naught. Okay, now that's obviously big uh, if you have a large mass, which is very unlikely on the micro scale, or if you have a very high frequency. Okay, because that makes this thing big, that obviously the velocity gets multiplied by. Uh, dv dt gives you an extra factor of f, so you get the factor of f there. Okay, so that term is large if you have, this term here, is large if you have a high frequency or a large mass. However, the drag term, if you look at the drag term here, it will dominate if the frequency is low. So the frequency is low, um, then of course this is not multiplied by the frequency, So um, whereas this one is, so it will start to get bigger. If the viscosity is high, or indeed the particle is small, because small would mean uh, small radius. Okay. Now, of course, the radius is related to the mass here, so you know we have to be careful there. So there'll be a crossover frequency <coughs> when that term, the viscous term, and the inertial term will be roughly of equal magnitude. Okay. When will that happen? Okay. So let's write down. The mass of our particle, assuming it's a sphere, it's 4 thirds pi rho rs cubed, where rho is the density of stuff, 
And let's take the density of water as being typical. You know, it could be slightly more, slightly less, it doesn't really matter, okay? So that's going to take, we're going to take the density of that. So we can figure out, more or less, if you tell me uh, what the radius of my particle is, I can tell you roughly what its mass will be, okay? To within an order of magnitude or so. Um, and so we're going to put um, that term equal to that term, and we end up with a crossover frequency, okay? So that's our crossover frequency, okay? If you're oscillating the particle, particle at a frequency higher than the crossover frequency, then the inertial term becomes important. If you're oscillating it lower than that frequency, the inertial term is unimportant and the viscous term becomes dominant, okay? And at the crossover frequency, they're both sort of equally important. So let's choose typical solvent. Uh, which will be water, which has a viscosity of 8.9 times to the minus 4 pascal seconds. So we'll just put that in. Um, most macroscopic fluids have, you know, viscosities which are not too much different from that. Um, and our particle, we'll choose as our, as our particle a polypropylene molecule um, like this, which has some kind of radius like that, which will take us 225 picometers. And if we plug that in, um, we get a scandalously high um, frequency of order 10 terahertz, okay? That's between infrared and microwave, and it's certainly a very, very high frequency. Most experiments on particles and such, you know, in, in liquids, are not interested in frequencies anywhere near that high. We're not interested in measuring the motion on that scale. Um, and for instance, uh, we will later on discuss the experiments of Parrain, who won the Nobel Prize for his experiments, where he looked at colloidal particles in solution, his colloidal particles have a radius of 0.5 micrometers, um, and if we plug the numbers in, we find that our frequency, uh, crossover frequency is 2.4 megahertz, uh, which corresponds to a time scale of 10 to the minus seconds, 10 to the minus seven seconds, and he measured things on the scale of 30 seconds, okay? So what that means is that for the vast majority of experiments, you can go back here, and you could ignore the inertial term, totally ignore it, okay? So what does that mean in practice? Well, in practice, what it means is that um, the MA term is zero, okay? And that means that um, in the microscopic scale, for most experimental purposes, F is equal to zero, okay? That doesn't mean things are stopped moving because F has in it minus six pi eta rv. So v has the velocity there, um, and plus some random part, plus some uh, maybe deterministic forces like electro electrostatic forces, for example. Um, so it doesn't mean things have stopped moving because you've got this v here, okay? So even when f equals zero, there's some velocity still. What it means for those kind of systems is ignoring the random force part that the velocity is proportional to the force. And that's a completely alien kind of mechanics for, uh, for us because we're used to the acceleration being proportional to the force. But in a viscous medium, particularly if you're, if you're tiny, um, the velocity is proportional to the force. Okay, so what does that mean for the Langevin equation? Well, we can rewrite the Langevin equation like this. Um, zeta times dx dt, where zeta is 1 on the mobility. It's 6, and the mobility, is, so zeta is 6 pi eta. Times um, times the radius of my um, of my uh, sphere. Okay, so that's the that's the viscous drag term equals the force minus the UDX. This is in one dimension plus the random force part. Okay, plus an extra term uh, which has to do with gradients in the mobility. Gradients in kBT divided by uh, divided by zeta. Okay, uh, divided by the friction constant. Um, and we're going to ignore this term, basically. Uh, it only happens in very special cases where you have you know, non-Cartesian coordinates or you have some diffusion constant, which depends on, on, on space somehow. But most of the time, we will ignore it. It only complicates things for us. But it's put there for completeness. So if you ever have to use this, you know, you've got it. Okay, so that's the Langevin equation. Okay. Now, we are going to do simulations on this. So... If you want to do simulations on this kind of system, what you do is you take this and you turn it into a finite difference equation. So the x dt, what you do is you say, right, that's zeta, x at time, no, sorry, where are we? 
x at time t plus delta t minus x at time t divided by delta t. So we do we do that for that for the left hand side here. Okay, there. Um, and we similarly can we can figure that out. Du dx is easy to figure out. The random part will figure out that, that easily as well. Um, and what the Langevin equation turns into in that case is a, a scheme for updating the particle. So this says the particle's position at time t plus delta t is its position at t um, plus a term due to the force plus a random force term plus another term which we're going to ignore. Okay. Uh, and um, so what we end up with here is an equation which we just iterate. So you take this, you say, oh, it's time at t plus delta t is equal to it's time at it's sorry, its position at t plus delta t is equal to its position at t uh, plus some other parts, and then just keep updating and updating and updating and go back and, and use it, use it again and again and loop around. Okay. Um, the only tricky part here are the random forces, which, as we've seen before, are Gaussian. They have mean zero because you have to go equally backwards and forwards with those things. And they have uh, a, uh, a correlation function, which basically uh, becomes a variance. So the correlation function is zero unless t and t prime are uh, equal. So they're completely uncorrelated in time. The kick you get at some time t is un completely uncorrelated with the time, the kick you get at some other time. Um, and when you do that, um, you find the variance, which would be g t g t, g t squared in other words, is equal to 2kt divided by zeta delta t. Okay, so that's, we haven't derived that, I'm just telling you what the answer is. Okay, so I just repeated this here. Um, now, uh, if you look at this, um, each of these is effectively a force, and so you get the force proportional to the square root of temperature, so g squared goes as t, um, and inversely as the friction constant, uh, and the other weird thing here is this force kick, if you like, is proportional to the square root of time because g squared goes as delta t. It's because it's the square root of the time step. Okay. Uh, so if you decrease your step by 100, the random steps, the random step bits decrease by a factor of 10. Okay. And this arises because we haven't done it yet, but we'll talk about diffusion later on. The motion is diffusive. It's a random walk. This, per this part gives you the random walk. Okay. Now, um, and to get g of t, you need to generate within the computer a Gaussian distribution um, with that distribution there and with the standard deviation equal to that. Okay, the variance equal to that, sorry. Okay, so that's what you need to do in a computer. You need to generate, take random numbers from that distribution. So the distribution you're taking random numbers for for the kicks is not a uniform distribution, it's Gaussian. You're taking random numbers from that distribution. And we will see how to do that. Let's let's do it. Okay, so let's take a single particle moving in one dimension in a potential which is A times cos Kx. So that's what it looks like. Here's, here's our potential, right? It's just a, a sorted potential. Here's our particle. Okay. We're just going to move it in a, in a potential which has amplitude A uh, and, uh, and it varies with a, you know, a wavelength which is 2 pi on K. And there's, there's our potential. This is u. This is x. Okay. So um, it's going to sit in this potential. Obviously, if I had, for example, a case where I had no um, no random forces and I started my particle off there, uh, even without inertia, would drag, it would go and actually sit at the bottom. Because there's no inertia, so it can't overshoot. So it can't go up there. Okay, it would just go straight down the bottom and stay there. If I started here, it would go down there. If I started there, it would go down to there. Okay, that's what it would do without random kicks. We're going to put random forces in, of course, because we want the Langevin equation. We're not doing classical mechanics, so we want to do um, something else. Here's our Python code. Uh, like before, we import some libraries for plotting and for doing numerical calculations. Not very exciting, but we need to do that, otherwise nothing will work. Um, we have an energy. So let's this is our energy function. It's a function of x of the amplitude and of k. Remember, it's u is equal to minus a cos kx, where a is the amplitude there. Okay, so that, that says define our energy function and, and then return it. Okay, so that's you know, that's a simple, simple function. Okay, um, and then of course we need to set up the data. We're going to choose, uh, initial, at least initially, an amplitude of 2, a uh, k wave number of 2, 
we're going to put the particle at the origin. We're going to set kt equal to 1. Um, we're going to have friction equal to 1. Uh, mobility is 1 over friction. Um, and we're going to set up a small distance d for calculating the derivative of the energy from first principle. So in the Langevin equation, you need minus du dx. Now I can do that numerically, of course. I can do it analytically, I mean. But we're going to do it numerically because in our subroutine, in our function, we have u. So the easiest way to do that is just to say that's minus of u of x plus d minus u of x divided by d, where d is small. And I'm going to choose d here equal to 0.0001. Okay, so it's a typical numerical trick you do. Don't bother calculating the, 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 the derivative analytically. You can just do it numerically. Um, and then we've got uh, a time step. That's how much we're going to be updating it by. Um, and we've got the standard deviation of the Gaussian noise for that sort of system. Remember, we need to generate Gaussian noise with this, where are we, go back here, with this kind of uh, variance. So we need the standard deviation. So we need delta t, you've got t, t, you've got the friction, so we've got everything there. Um, where are we? Back to here. Uh, and we're going to do it for a, so I don't know, large numbers of time steps. Or what to, okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and then basically what we're going to do is we're going to start the particle off and then we're just going to loop over this thing. This is, this is, this is, our, this is our Langevin equation here. It tells you what dx is. dx is, you know, uh, the, the noise part. Um, here's, the, here's the noise part, okay? Uh, this is the energy part, okay, the, the force part. Uh, and then we're going to say x equals x plus dx. Uh, time equals time plus dt. Uh, and at the same time, we're going to start storing the position um, and the time, and the potential as well if you want to, but we don't do that. And then we just keep going. We just, we just loop, loop over this, keep going back, back and forth, just loop around and around and around. And that's that's what we do. And so, uh, and we're going to store our um, our positions um, uh, and uh, and this, the time. Okay, so we can do that as well. And we're going to plot um, time and position. Position versus time. So here's some data. Here's the output. Okay, so we're going to start with an amplitude of 3 and a kt of 1. Um, uh, so you can see actually that the amplitude is significantly larger than the, um, than the temperature, uh, but uh, they both have units of energy. Uh, kt is units of energy here, of course. The weight numbers too, that's not particularly important. But they're not, they're not that different. Okay, those two numbers are not that different. And so we're going to start that particle off here. Okay, and this graph here is position versus time. Okay, uh, and you can see it starts off at the origin and stays there for a little while. Okay, so it's going like this. Okay, uh, and then suddenly it goes shoom, straight over into another well and oscillates around. The oscillator is oscillated about minus three something or other, which is what about there. Okay, and then it goes. So that keeps oscillating there and goes, then it goes back and keeps oscillating around here. Okay. And then it chooses next time to go over that well and oscillate in there because that's where it is there. So about three. Then it will choose again to go into the next well. And then it's choosing to go actually further on over here somewhere. Okay. And then it starts going backwards and forwards. So it's, it's doing a sort of random walk, but spending quite a lot of time sometimes in the bottom of each well. Okay. Before it gets enough random kicks to actually go over the barrier. So that's what it's, this particle is doing. It's going through the going over the barrier, getting enough random energy. Okay, so that's with a amplitude which is a bit larger than the temperature energy. Okay, so that's typically what happens. Now if we, however, choose an amplitude of this here, which is much, much larger. So here it was about um, three. Uh, this graph is wrong, of course. This should be 10, okay? Uh, this just tells you the shape of the graph. But um, same wave number as before, same temperature as before, 1. Uh, and in this case, what happens is you can see, this is time, position, it sticks basically around the origin between, you know, plus 0.6 and minus 0.6. So it's basically stuck here all the time because this barrier here is now uh, 20, okay? It's 10 plus 10. And it's basically going to take a long time to get over that barrier. And so it basically doesn't in, in, the, sh in the thousand time steps we've done. Okay, so it just doesn't go over the barrier, um, which is fair enough. 
So that's what that does. You increase the barrier height, it sits at the bottom of the well and hardly ever escapes. Okay. Now we'll do the opposite case. Okay. We're going to take an amplitude and, uh, in other words, a barrier height and a temperature which are roughly equal. Okay. So this has been now reduced to one. Okay. What happens? Well, what happens is the particle sort of starts here at the origin and starts to do, 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 but it very rapidly goes, um, uh, well, it, go, it goes to 20, so it very rapidly goes all the way over to here somewhere. So it goes, it just randomly walks over to here, and it, sort of, you know, it starts to walk backwards a bit. And it, it's basically so hot, and the barrier is so low, so the barrier is low, it's almost ignoring the barriers, and it's basically just doing a random walk as if the, the potential didn't exist at all. Okay, so that's the three different cases we have there. Um, we have um, sort of moderately high barrier, it's hop is staying within the within the uh, within the uh, little wells and hopping between them occasionally. Very high barrier. Uh, it basically doesn't get out of the well it started in for a long time. And low barrier, in which case it just ignores the barriers and just wanders around. Okay, and that's what the Langevin equation tells you. All right, so that's an example of the Langevin equation without inertia. It's very very important. This is a one dimensional example. Of course, you can do it with you know three dimensional particles as well. Um, and so, so far we've done Metropolis Monte Carlo, which tells us nothing about dynamics, but which is very useful for the static systems, for the stat mech. We've got Langevin uh, equation, which tells us quite, quite a good deal about the dynamics. Um, and then uh, there are many other kind of simulation techniques. Uh, I'll just mention one, which is molecular dynamics. Now, molecular dynamics is, is in some sense the most you know, brute force uh, and stupid way of doing things, um, but it's not entirely trivial, okay? So what you do with the molecular dynamics simulation is you take all the particles and you put them in a box and you have the potentials between them and you start them off with some motion and you just solve Newton's equations for every single particle, okay? Now, this is an extremely time-consuming kind of simulation because in the Langevin simulation, remember, we had one particle... Uh, which is surrounded by a sea of other particles, which we then sort of make these, this sea doesn't really do anything. It doesn't, you don't, you don't have to keep track of what all these particles are doing. They're just random kicks, okay? And there might be more than one particle. There might be more, some, a few other large particles here. But in practice, in that system, you are ignoring most of the solvent molecules and you're only taking into account the molecules which you are interested in, those ones, okay? And so it's a relatively quick way of simulating things. Molecular dynamics is totally different in the sense that um, you are taking into account every single particle. You are tracking that particle, that solvent particle and this solvent particle as well as these other things which you might be interested in. So it's much more time consuming. Okay, um, And so you don't have, however, all these complications with random forces because every particle has its own deterministic trajectory and the random forces are no longer there. Okay, they come out of the simulation in some sense. Um, so it's a very slow method of doing things, um, and there are certain other issues. Um, for instance, thermostating. What happens? What happens to the particles when they hit the boundary? Um, how do you keep the temperature constant in this kind of system? These are all um, questions which rely, uh, which require a lot of thinking. Um, so this is not molecular dynamics is by no means a trivial kind of uh, simulation technique, but it's one. Um, which uh, can be used depending on you know, depending on what sort of detail you want to know, know things about. Okay, so um, that's the end of that video.